Professor Luck. Okay. Professor Luck, you go anywhere on New Year's? Uh, uh yeah. Uh, we'll see. Um, we'll see if I if we have some nice fun, go for a swim or something. We usually go for a New Year's dip, jump in the lake, a little ice water wow. swim every New Year's. Okay. Because me and Ploy and my son will go to to Japan. Really? Yes. In our uh, first cool. of Jan until 10, so maybe I can meet you in Japan. Ah, uh, but I'm I'm not cool. in in my home. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Actually, I am 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 in my my son's house in in Yokohama. Okay, okay, so okay, okay. that will be difficult. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let, let's see. Let's see. Okay, so our participants started to come. Let's let's wait for a couple of minutes. Stay. Uh, sure. Okay. Professor Luck, maybe I cannot record because I didn't. Uh, it's, it doesn't allow me to click the start recording. Okay, then I, I will try to do that. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, maybe just do a screen screen record. Ah, uh, yes. You use um, Windows video clip capture directly. What or what? Okay, I try. Okay, um, good morning, good evening, good day, everybody. Um, first of all, I would like to record this session. Okay, so if, if you agree, please stay. And if you don't agree, you are welcome to leave. Okay, because I'm going to record this video. Okay, from now on. Okay. Um, good morning again. Good evening. Good day, everybody. Um, so I'm pleased that today we will have a, a talk by Professor Steve Mann, who is a professor at University of Toronto and is also running some companies. Okay. Steve is known as the father of wearable computing and he as you can guess from the name he has invented many 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 things okay and more information on him is available on wikipedia so you can search with steve man and you can find a wikipedia page uh, summarizing his achievements so okay without further ado okay so i will leave this um tipsy to to Steve. Okay, Steve. Hello. Is yours. My name is Steve Mann, and I'm speaking about some of the things that we've been working on, like the extendiverse, the extended metaverse, kind of going beyond the metaverse. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen. So I'll share screen yeah. two. So you should see at the moment some video feedback as, as we're just feeding back probably see yourself there. And then I'm going to switch over to this extend verse here. And so 
what we're doing, a number of us have been thinking about this idea of the extended metaverse going beyond the metaverse. Something, what's the next thing after metaverse? And also what's, what's our general catch all for all of this sort of thing. And this is, uh, you know, thank you for the uh, ENT TC and the HMI TC for inviting me here, making this possible. And the six of us here are, are just kind of looking at an idea for XV as the extended meta una omniverse. Uh, myself, I've been kind of at this for many years now. For the last 48 years or so, I've been kind of playing around with wearable technologies, things attached to my body to sort of mediate or augment or virtualize or what we really talk about is extending human perception. Here's a little drawing or, 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 or diagram. If I think of two axes, reality and virtuality, uh, on the reality axis, we have physical reality. And on the virtuality axis, we have virtual reality. And uh, here we have physical reality and virtual reality. And physical reality is the world of atoms. And virtual reality is the world of bits. Atoms is a Greek word that starts with the letter alpha. The first letter of, the, of that Greek word is alpha. So we let that first axis be alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet. And the second axis, beta. And then we can think of this as a simple taxonomy, physical reality and virtual reality. Actually divide up the the plane into quadrants we've got you know less reality more reality and less virtuality more virtuality and so if you consider say augmented reality it adds a, a third element to that to that graph we've got reality virtuality and augmented reality has some reality and some virtuality and this is the company that we started uh, called meta and we, this is the meta, the original meta eyeglass. And that's an example of what you might call augmented reality, or as we'll see later, it extends beyond that. There's a missing quadrant here though, near the origin, which is what we'll call diminished reality. DR is deliberately diminished reality, kind of the opposite of augmented reality. If you have an augmented cord, you can also have a diminished cord and so this set of four realities kind of divides the atoms bits plane into four quadrants. Diminished reality is reality that's deliberately diminished. None of the previous realities directly address sensory attenuation technologies like earplugs, sunglasses, HDR welding helmets, sensory isolation tanks, and so on. Total sensory isolation defines the origin of the zero point in the XV continuum. And so we could put a float tank right at the origin as an example of diminished reality, something that deliberately gives us less reality. Now that doesn't say it gives us less perception because you might hallucinate or imagine things when you're inside this float tank, but it's talking about technology. This is a taxonomy of technology not of perception. It's a taxonomy of what things are, not what they do. And so here we have in the lower left quadrant, technologies that reduce our perception of reality. Uh, over in the lower right quadrant, we've got physical reality. This is an ice water swim. We swim almost every day in the ice water. And that's a form of reality where you're presenting yourself with a strong visual percept of reality. In fact, all the senses really are involved when you jump into cold ice water. In the upper right, we've got augmented reality. And the example I have here is my swim glass. So underwater, I'm swimming in ice water. And I've got this augmented overlay that's adding. So I've got some bits and some atoms, so to speak. And in the upper left, I'm in an isolation float tank wearing a VR headset. So the float tank cuts off all outside stimulus. 
all outside stimulus is removed by the float tank and then I've got the VR glass to fill it in. So there's your four quadrants. This is the work on the float tanks from back in 2004, 2003, VR float tanks, virtual reality float tank. And that gives us, in a sense, the XR continuum, the extended reality continuum with these four quadrants. And then extended reality, the goal of extended reality is to reach beyond these. So XR does two things. One is it replaces all these other realities. We can take all these other realities away and replace them with one single thing called XR where X is a mathematical variable. We can say let X equal any amount of alpha or beta. Let X go anywhere in that plane, interpolating between any of these existing realities and moreover extrapolating beyond them. So X is an interpolator as well as an extrapolator. So it replaces and subsumes and interpolates between all the existing realities and it extends beyond them. So that's what XR is all about. So XR, for example, you try to go past 100% and maybe you're fully immersed in reality and you get a heightened sense of reality with this extra biofeedback. So using biofeedback and trainment, we can hone ourselves even more into reality than 100%. And so here's an early example of XR. Uh, in my childhood, one of my favorite childhood hobbies was photographing and visualizing and seeing electromagnetic radio waves. So this is a radio wave. This is a photograph of a radio wave from 1974. And this is an early example of extending beyond reality. Uh, being able to see in the infrared, ultraviolet, see radio waves, see sound waves, and extend beyond the normal range of, of human reality perception. And that's kind of what extended reality is aimed at. This is metavision, the vision of vision, sensing sensors and sensing their capacity to sense. So here's 36 photographs of a surveillance camera with this array of electric lights that I was waving around to make it visible. And the purpose of this is to see and understand metavalence wave functions and, and valence flux and metavision, which is the vision of vision. Meta means beyond in a sort of self-referential sense. A meta conversation is a conversation about conversations. A meta argument is an argument about arguments. And meta vision is the vision of vision. So meta sensing is the sensing of sensors, sensing sensors and sensing their capacity to sense. So this is an example of XR. It, it's, it's not really virtual reality or augmented reality or mixed reality or anything like that. It's a new kind of thing, which is allowing us to see and understand beyond reality. So this was uh, a, an early experiment that I came up with in 1974 when I had a police radar connected to a cathode ray oscillograph that was moving back and forth. And it was actually with that oscillograph in the upper left corner of the picture there that my dad got for me when I was about 12 years old. It was broken, someone was throwing it away. And the trace on there wasn't working properly, the time base was broken. And so the dot would only go up and down. And I was impatient and wanted to see the waveform on it. So what I did is I started moving it back and forth on, on rollers. And when I was rolling it back and forth on rollers, I discovered something quite remarkably interesting. That is to say that a oscillograph created a Doppler shift of the very signal that it was sensing and made visible the otherwise invisible electromagnetic radio wave shearing the space-time continuum in a set of coordinates in which the speed of light was exactly zero. And I called this the sequential wave imprinting machine. 
here's a more modern example, Internet of Things. See, this early example with the radar uh, is, is a good example that people can understand because a radar is a sensor and a, a radar detector is a meta sensor, a sensor of sensors. And then the police would sometimes use radar detector detectors to see if anyone had a radar detector. And then you could envision citizens with a radar detector, detector, detector to see if the police have radar detector detectors. And, and so each of these levels is kind of a meta level of sensing, of sensing, of sensing, of sensing, and so on. And so this is a simple photograph of some hand wash faucets showing their capacity to sense. Uh, we can use this technology, this sequential wave and printing machine. Here's an example of a photograph of a car with swim to test the sensors in the car. So self-driving cars have various sensors in them. And we might ask simple questions like, are those sensors in good working order? And here we might have a photograph to show that the sensors are, are sensing as we expect them to be sensing. Here's the camera at the back of the car. There's a backup camera. And this is a photograph with a drone swarm, a swarm of drones. And the drones swarm around and sense the sensing. Here's another example. Sensing sensors. And if you look at the website, wherecam.org slash dronesworms.pdf, you can see a little bit more on those drone swarms. This is a, a motor. And on the motor, I've attached an array of 100 LEDs. And what we did is set this up so that it shows the, elect, uh, the, the magnetic field inside the motor. So this is like a polar oscilloscope that travels around with the motor and the shaft of the motor is clamped in the vise attached to the workbench. So there's two ways of thinking of this equally correct. One way to think of it is imagine if we're like looking at the magnetic field from the perspective of an ant standing on the shaft of the motor turning with it. The other way to look at it is the motor turns the vice, which turns the workbench, which turns the, the building, and which turns the whole planet Earth and turns the whole universe. And so the motor turns the whole universe around. And so the universe sees the magnetic field turning inside the motor in coordinates that are standing still. So again, we're sort of modifying the space-time continuum to put ourselves in a set of coordinates in which the speed of wave propagation is exactly equal to zero. And that's kind of the idea of swim in one way or another. This is another example with a bicycle. Uh, I've got a, a bicycle here with a swim, a linear swim attached to it, but the linear swim is displaying the magnetic field and the rotating the rotating magnetic field in the motor of the e-bike. So this is an e-bike, a bicycle with a motor in it. And what we see is the three phases, the red, green, and blue traces are showing the, the current flowing in the, in, in the three phase windings of the motor. And then of course I've labeled the, the axis and put some grid lines on there. We, we have a little character generator and grid line generating for reticule or graticule along with the waveform. This is a photograph of the interference pattern of the capacity of two microphones to listen. So there's two Shure SM58 microphones here with a little robot that swims out the microphones and shows us the capacity of the microphones to listen. I have a cathode ray oscillograph there uh, in XY mode, and you can see the XY plot of the real and imaginary parts of the baseband. When we slow that rate down to zero, of course, it becomes a complex valued waveform. And then I've got my lock-in amplifier at the bottom there. And that's a project that, that we did in collaboration with Sun Yatsen University. So this swim gives us a way of seeing and understanding the world. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, going to go back for a second. I'll just unshare my screen. Yeah, can you see me now? Mm, yes. Okay, yeah, so yeah. this is that one of, this is a swim sequential wave and printing machine, an array of a hundred linear array of a hundred LEDs. And on a lock-in amplifier, it's showing this is a smartphone, and you can see the waveform from the smartphone as I move this. It's an index into that waveform. And so this is the observation that I made in 1974 with the SWIM, with the sequential wave and printing machine. And if I go through a piece of concrete, the waveform is weaker. And if I go through a piece of wood, it's a little bit stronger than the concrete. But And if I go through both the concrete and the wood, the wave is weaker still, but you can still see some waveform there. Now, if I go through my hand, do you think my hand will block more or less than the concrete or more than the brick or somewhere in between? So here I've got, let me look at that again. We've got, this is the, the concrete and the, and the wood. And then this is the waveform itself. And then if I block it with my hand, so you can see my hand actually blocks more than the concrete and the wood together. And now if I put one finger over it, there it is. If I put just one finger over it, it blocks quite a bit, two fingers, three fingers, four fingers. You can see if I block it with four fingers it blocks quite a bit versus just having it open here or even one finger. So you can see various amounts of attenuation and it gives us an idea. So the swim gives us an idea or a way of seeing beyond reality and that's what we mean by meta vision beyond the normal reality. And so now I'm going to go back to sharing my screen Share that, and I'll go back to here again. And this is a definition of XR from when Charles Wyckoff and I wrote about this in 1991 when I started at MIT. And this is an example of collaborative shared XR. When we share and collaborate in XR, we call that XV, extendiverse. So XV is shared XR. And you, Jan, and I came up with this definition of XV. And the basic idea here is we can think of the metaverse as shared VR, and we can think of the extendiverse as shared XR. And then I want to also just take a look at we're just working. Uh, so we've got this Phil Filippo, uh, and I have been kind of working on on diagramming this in 3D. And so you can see here near the origin, so you got these three axes, reality or atoms alpha, and then virtuality or bits beta, and sociality or genes gamma. And then near the origin, we've got diminished reality and then out on reality, you got physical reality, and out on virtual reality, you got virtual reality, and then augmented reality out both ways, extended reality further out. 
and then the metaverse is a shared or social or collaborative virtual reality. And then more generally, the extendiverse is a shared or collaborative X reality. In other words, all the realities. So let, let X be the set of all realities. And so XR is all realities. And XV is all the verses. So XV is this generalized verse. So again, you can kind of get a sense here that we have, uh, you know, the extended verse is this, this, this extension into all the verses. So here's a couple of examples. A collaborative reality experience is like ice water swimming together with no VR. And then you've got the metaverse, which is communal VR, shared VR. And then you've got XR shared such as when we're going this ice water swimming with these shared eyeglasses as a group. And so there's some grand challenges to solve in this new field of XR and XV. And one is standards. Another is human factors. There's reliability, ruggedization, power consumption, heat dissipation, these sort of technical problems. There's storage and transmission of data. And then there's an ethical stance, advancing technology for humanity, which is something that the IEEE really specializes on. I want to touch on this fifth one briefly. So consider here a scale as a function. So S is a scaling function. So instead of how much reality, how much virtuality, and how much sociality there is, let's consider the three axis being the scale on which the reality occurs, the scale of the virtuality, and the scale of the sociality. So the scale of the physical reality here is goes from atoms out to the edge of the universe. And you've got, you know, wearables and then and then smart cars and smart cities and smart states and eventually smart world and smart universe and then on the social axis you've got individual couple family team community corporation nation the law of the sea the ocean you know international laws world government and eventually the law of outer space and so we can also have these. So on these three axes, we have, we have these scales. And if we look at the inverse of these, one over S of alpha, one over S of beta, and one over S of gamma, it gives us body ownership and control, these three axes. And so this is kind of a reversed look at these eight octants of this taxonomy in terms of the body and the ownership, that card there, represents an ownership like you might have a vehicle ownership and the control knob there which i'm grabbing with my fingers that represents control so there's a control axis an ownership axis and a body axis the body axis says to what extent things are wearable in other words it's kind of a smallness axis it's like one over s of alpha it is it is regarding how how small our, this technology is, it closes down and around us. Like you've got smart cities, smart buildings, and as you get smaller and smaller, it gets down into smart clothing. And that's the wearability axis. This is a, a good way to think because a couple of simple examples we can think of come from popular culture. You know, when we enter into in science fiction or movies or popular culture, when people travel through time and space, their clothes generally travel with them. And when they don't, it's almost humorous or unexpected. Like this very funny Scotty, now beam me up my clothes. That's sort of a look at, a humorous look at, at the way clothing is assumed to be part of us. Another good example is when you walk past the marina 
you often hear one captain of a boat will say, you hit me when the two boats collide. It's not like your boat hit my boat. People just say that you hit me when their boats or their cars or their bicycles collide. Even when people's clothes bump into each other, I wouldn't say your shirt hit my shirt. I would just say that you hit me. So that's, we've internalized the idea that these technologies are part of our body. So there's body ownership and control are these three axes or dimensions. Along the body axis, you've got the environment and the environment. The environment is that which surrounds us and the environment is us ourselves. Now, cyborgs have existed for more than a million years. Manfred Klein said his favorite example of cyborg is a person riding a bicycle, but I've always argued, and I think it's kind of self-evident that, that a vessel is as much a cyborg technology as a bicycle. In fact, the word cyborg means cybernetic organism. And the word cybernetic is a Greek word, which means helmsman, i.e. the person who steers a boat or vessel. So in some sense, cybernetic means steering a boat. So obviously it makes common sense that a boat is a form of cyborg technology, paddle boards that might've existed for many, many years. Here's another good example. This is Christina inside one of these fun walk on water balls where you can go inside the ball and run around on the surface of the water. And here's the ball in the park. And so the environment is what's inside the ball and the environment is what's outside the ball. And the ball itself we call the environment. And we like to think of the environment is part of the environment rather than part of the environment. So the environment is shown in green here and the environment is shown in red and the environment includes the ball. So the environment is part of the environment and that's kind of what we think of clothing as part of ourselves. So, so that will hopefully get ourselves into an interesting discussion about XV. I'll turn off my screen sharing now and uh, just go back to the Jitsi here and turn off my screen sharing. So can you see me now? Yes, yes. Okay. okay. So maybe, maybe that will give us a, a good starting point for some discussion. Okay, um, thank you very much, Steve, for this very, very unique and interesting eye-opening talk. Um, so I, we, I would like to hear some opinions, comments, or questions from, from the audience. Um, there is a button to raise your hand, just like Zoom. Okay, if, please raise your hand first. Okay, we got one. Okay, go ahead, Peter Watt. Thank you for your wonderful talk. Uh, it really, well, helped take me out of the world for a bit. Uh, when you have shown the three axis diagram, and you have mentioned that, for example, the virtual reality, if we extend it, it will become the metaverse, right? As well as the uh, XV, right? So what would be a thing if we extend the AR or the DR or the PR in the axis of the uh, social? Oh, so these are all X, all XV, because remember that X is a general mathematical variable that can represent anything. So XR is any and all of the realities. So physical reality, virtual reality is XR, augmented reality is XR. So XR extrapolates and interpolates. X is a variable that extrapolates and interpolates. 
between all the other realities, beyond all the other realities, and also includes all the other realities. So since X is a general variable like this, when you take X into the soci into the sociality dimension, it includes all of these. So XV is a generalization that includes the metaverse. So take all the other realities, like virtual reality is shared, shared virtual reality, shared augmented reality, shared physical reality, shared diminished reality. And you take all of those, and that is XV, as well as shared XR. Well, in the extended thank sense. You. Thank you. Uh, in, in this case, uh, so XV is kind of like when you show it, three axis stack, yeah, it kind of like everything was go in on the uh, positive side, right? We kind of extend everything, so it become the XV. Then just think about it, and then I just wonder what what would happen if we instead of go into the positive direction, but go into the negative direction in this. So kind of like instead of you having 150% of reality, now you have like minus 50% reality. Can it happen? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. Like we have to define what we mean by negative amounts of reality. Like if we think of reality as an energy function, um, it's it becomes complex when we start to think about negative energy. And so, uh, obviously, if we take logarithms of these axes, they can go in both directions, and we can set zero as the defining point. Like if we take our our center origin as halfway or part way, like environment versus environment, it's logical to take the human scale, maybe one meter from my body, as the origin, and then think in a logarithmic scale and go both positive and negative. That's certainly a reasonable thing to do as far as actually going negative on bits, because bits are kind of a Claude Shannon sense of information capacity for analog or digital information. What does it mean to have negative information? So I think that that would certainly be an interesting discussion to talk about negative quantities of social engagement, because when you're alone, when you're all alone, that's like the smallest unit or, or the, we can think of the smallest amount. But it would certainly be interesting to start talking about negative energy and negative social engagement and negative information content. For, for me, if I think in terms of a sense, when we say about the sense, it, when we gain some information, right? Maybe if we go into the negative direction, it could be mean that, uh, we lost some information in his of gaining. So maybe it maybe like when you have dementia, when you do some action in his of creating and gaining new information, you actually lost something. Yeah. Yeah, that would certainly be something fun to explore. Mm -hmm. Okay, and thank you and Okay, thank you, thank Peter you. Watt. And yeah, um, Steve's answer on using the logarithm trick is also is very interesting. Yes, because with applying the log log function, we we can go with positive values only. Yes, and Steve, you see, uh, actually the person who asked you this question of and me went to the same junior high school, so we have similar question to you about negative values. <laughs> Okay. And um, okay. Any any questions from the audience? Um. Okay. Maybe while waiting for other audiences to raise you comments or question, I I also have a question. Um. I I have a I my my research background is AI. Okay. AI agents, believable AI agents or even sentient AI agents kind of. So um, I would like to know the roles of those AIs, uh, even social bots in your in your diagram. Um, 
initially I thought that it's there are something related to the sociality axis, but when I saw you diagram today, it's, it seemed to be more related to the computer science axis, um, the virtual reality. So what 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 do you think that that is? Yeah, that's yeah. that's certainly a, an interesting look. Like one thing to think of is is X, XV is is sort of a, an intelligent, uh, like like one thing we talked about in the IEEE is extended intelligence, the CXI. We formed this group called the the uh, Council on Extended Intelligence. About fifty of us or so in the IEEE organized that group, and we could think about XV. Is kind of an intelligent XR, you know, XR with together with XI. And we might think of bringing intelligence to the to extended reality. And so, in many ways, sentient agents and social bots could be thought of as part of that intelligence that comes into the into the extendiverse. And certainly, humanistic intelligence, which are, are human human humanistic intelligence hi which is intelligence that arises by having the human being in the feedback loop of the computational process hi we could certainly play that in there as well and i think that would spread out uh between the 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 virtuality axis and the sociality axis kind of depending on how it was because hi facilitates collaboration between various different people so humanistic intelligence can be collective humanistic intelligence where a group of people are made intelligent by this kind of computational process and in that way we kind of have this collective humanistic intelligence spread out across the virtuality and sociality axes oh i see so they they fall into that plane i see I see. A lot okay, of them would I... fall into that planet. Okay. Some of them may okay. even engage with the real world too. It's it's quite possible that some of this intelligence could be facilitated across physicality as well. Like like when you think of of intelligence that could arise from physical, mechanical, real world yeah, processes. Some, I see something like um, humanoid terminator, yeah. for example. <laughs> Okay, okay. So, um, thank you, Steve. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay, um, I we got one. Okay, Sholakon, go ahead. Okay, uh, can you explain about in environment again? Uh, sorry, could you restate your question again? I, 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 I could not hear. It oh, okay uh, can you hear me clearly now much better yes oh, okay so uh can you explain again about the about invi environment environment and environment okay yes Steve. so the environment is that which surrounds us it means what what's around us so your environment is what it, it is what's around you so you might have a natural environment at a beach, you know, you've got trees and forest and the sky above you and the ground below you is part of the environment. And then there's the office environment and the office environment might include the overhead fluorescent lighting in the office, the walls of the office, cubicles and dividers. Those are all part of the office environment or a prison or jail environment might include the concrete walls and the jail bars those are part of the environment that which surrounds you that's what the word environment sort of means now what we mean by environment is everything else so if you take your environment if you take the whole universe and take away your environment from that what's left is you yourself so like if you look at what's in your environment versus your own self is the environment. And the environment is the boundary 
between the environment and the environment. So if I go back to my screen share and sort of look at like this example here, can you see that? The, so the ball is a good example here. What's around the outside of the uh, ball sorry, is I the environment. I couldn't see that. Hmm? I, I couldn't see your screen now. I only oh, hang see on a your, second. Am I yeah. sharing the screen? Yourself. Can you see it now? Let me. Okay, perfect. So see the, the environment is shown in green and the environment is shown in red in the red shaded area here. And we think of a social distance, like that ball is about two meters in diameter. So if we had two people in individual balls, they would be two meters apart at, at least, which certainly ensures social distancing. And so each of us has an environment and you're part of my environment and I'm part of your environment. And each of us has our own environment, which is us ourselves. This example may be even, even more noteworthy, I suppose, because in outer space, the environment around you in the environment, there's kind of a, a fairly strongly contained boundary between those two. Oh, okay, thank you. And uh, ha I have another question. So that means that environment is a thing about uh, between ourselves and environment, right? So I have a question that, uh, for example, about a case like personal computer, uh, is this considered an uh, environment or environment? Because uh, for my understanding, I think that when I playing computer games or something, the computer will be my environment. But, uh, but when I am using computer, so I, I think it can be considered environment as well. So what, what is your idea about this? Yeah, there's some strong boundaries between the environment and the environment. Like in, in, in some ways that boundary can be soft or hard. So in the example of a spacesuit, it's relatively fully enveloping. Or with the ball, the boundary is fully enclosing. But if I'm on my paddle board, the boundary is a little bit softer, a little bit less sharply defined. And certainly, in some cases that people might have some discussion about which where this boundary is, like, if I'm on a bicycle, I might think of the bicycle as part of me, or I might think of the car as part of me. But what if I'm on a really large yacht? Would that be part of me? And this kind of becomes this philosophical question, like, like that ancient Greek ship that's made when all the parts of it are replaced, is it still the same ship? We could ask a similar question as we have a sliding scale of larger and larger environments, whether those environments are still part of us and to what extent and how much can I carry when I go around. So some of the wearable computers I used to have were pretty big and clunky and people used to sometimes complain and say, oh, that's not really like, like they wouldn't see that as part of you. They say, you, you know, you're, you're, you're carrying that thing or it's not really part of you. Like if you walk around carrying a hammer, is that really part of your environment or environment? A hammer is like a tool that changes how we understand the world, but is it really part of us to the same extent? Whereas eyeglasses are more con considered part of us. The example is from, even if I'm holding up a camera and walking around looking through it, sometimes people complain about the camera, but it's less likely, they have less right to complain maybe when it's part of an eyeglass device that's part of our own seeing or part of our own environmental space. Okay, thank you. It's very clear answer. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, any other comments or thoughts from the audience?
Okay. Uh, Peter what? Please. Okay. Uh, when when I heard about the environment and environment, I just wonder. For example, in the in the case that you have the neural links implant into your brain, then I know that it doesn't have the clear answer, right? But in the case that you have to balance between the security and privacy of people, should we treat the neural link that already implanted into someone's brain as a part of their body or just a normal object? What is your opinion? Yeah, I mean, there, there, I think this is going to be a, a lot of discussion around this. Like, if you think of also how much you have to ask the questions around body ownership and control. When you think of BOC, body ownership and control, um, that's when it really gets interesting because all of a sudden now, like handcuffs are a good example of an environment that comes in close. We don't think of the handcuffs as part of the environment, even though they're wearable. So if we look at it in terms of body ownership and control, we look at is the Neuralink controlled by somebody else? So like if you have prisoners with the impl brain implants for obedience purposes, that might be a little bit different because then their own body becomes part of the, then, then they're, they're, they're the internal sort of exit from their own environment. Handcuffs bring your hands into the environment, for example, and the same thing could be true of inside the body. In, in that case, it being that the boundary between the environment and environment is very subjective, right? It depends on the yes. person, how they perceive it. Thank yeah, you. this taxonomy doesn't answer all the questions. It simply tells us which questions are important to ask. I think the three questions that are really important to ask are body, ownership, and control. That is those axes, you know, one over S of alpha, one over S of beta, one over S of gamma. Those are sort of the three axes upon which we might want to discuss and understand XV. And think of XV as just the space into which we can taxonomize these various technologies and have an intelligent discussion with a common framework or common grounding upon which to base that discussion. Okay, um, any, any other questions? Okay, um, if no, then I would like to thank all of you uh, for attending this talk, include all the audience and speaker. Okay, thank you very much. And we have really nice discussions. So I'm going to stop uh, recording and now, but I don't know how to do that. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for, for inviting me to, to present and check out our our work, openxv.org. Uh, could you send that uh, on chat space, please? On the chat. Yeah, you guys know how to use the chat, right? Yeah, we can see. Okay, that one. There's also some on my YouTube channel's Hydraulist. And... Oh. Uh, Okay. And that's also another good, another good place to sort of check it out. Okay. Um, wait a minute. We have one, one of the audience raising their hand. Okay, Ibrahim, go ahead. Sorry, Professor. That was a mistake. I was doing the another thing. Oh, I see. I see. It's okay. 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 Then. Um. So. Um. Actually, from now on. Um members of special interest group on metaverse would like to continue uh, our discussions um general audience uh, you um thank you so much okay 